Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And welcome everyone to Well Read, the November edition. And tonight we have a special guest for you this evening featuring Georgiana uh, Sanchez and Ruth Nolan and Lucille Lang Day as our special guest. And um, want to also welcome Joe Miller, our co-sponsor, president of Works San Jose. And he's in their new digs out there in downtown San Jose. What do you got for us, Joe, in terms of uh, <laughs> the view? Yeah, all right, thanks. Well, we're out here, we're out here in, the, in the lobby of uh, Open San Jose. And um, we're gonna walk, uh, walk on into works and take a look. Uh, things are getting uh, put together for a new exhibition um, that's opening up. Uh, um, well, it's not opening with an open reception this week, but uh, our first regular gallery hours, there's some work by Sarah, it's gotta go up on the walls. Our first regular gallery hours here on Saturday. Um, so very exciting. Um, this new space is, uh, significantly taller, uh, as you can see, than our earlier space, um, which of course you could kind of like there and like hit the lights. These lights are 12 feet up, so you're not gonna do that. But, uh, but I did get to, uh, to hang these wonderful sculptures by um, Tai Bui up there at about, uh, at about 12 feet in the rafters there. So um, that's gonna be kind of a fun show. He's got little uh, rocks uh, kind of, well, not little, actually rather large rocks uh, kind of uh, um, notched together uh, in here. But um, uh, this show is called Resilience. It was actually programmed uh, before the... Mm Joe, I think you've uh, accidentally muted yourself. When did I do that? <laughs> oh, well, um, so we were looking at we were looking at work by Tai Bui up there, the, the rocks. I don't know if you uh, if you heard that one, but um, uh, but anyways, um, uh, this space uh, is um, going to hold, uh, of course, uh, poetry readings. We've already had uh, two of our um, flash fiction forum readings here. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. But if it doesn't fit in this room, if we've got like too many sculptures in that that uh, are going on, then down the hall, um, there's like workshop rooms and, and uh, um, there's a film studio here that's 2000 square feet that we could uh, set up chairs in, um, as well as then uh, some areas where, um, uh, where maybe as many as uh, 50 or 60 people could uh, could comfortably be seated. Uh, so far, our biggest reading here had about 25 people for the last uh, well-read. So it was kind of a nice set, not well-read, sorry, flash fiction form. Um, we will get back to well-read here, uh, I hope, uh, at some point soon. So um, uh, there's the biggest one. That one's a monster, just for uh, um, for reference. There's my hand. That's a big rock. And uh, um, I didn't have to hang that from the ceiling. It's got a little, uh, it's got a little wood notch. So all I had to do, all I had to do actually was go up 12 feet and get it up there uh, into the rafters. Um, the room is, is at 15. So we get some nice high walls here that uh, we can bring in much, much larger pieces. Um, whereas those of you who visited the earlier works, all of our walls were eight feet tall. So, um, so quite the, um, quite the, uh, um, the step up. But anyways, want to invite you guys to come. Um, our regular hours uh, this coming weekend uh, and the next is going to be noon to four on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we're not open this Friday, but the next Friday it'll be open uh, noon to six. And then um, we'll have an opening for this exhibition, uh, Resilience, which, uh, as I mentioned, was the, the last show uh, that we um, canceled before COVID and uh, sort of coincidentally with that kind of theme of, of resilience and in overcoming adversity. Um, 
but anyways, this will have its uh, opening on first Friday, December. So come out first Friday, December. Um, and if you don't make that, but you still want to have a party, um, there's going to be a closing party for the exhibition on December 18. So lots of things ahead. Um, just like you do for Poetry Center, follow us uh, at Work San Jose, just all one word, uh, W-R-K-S-S-A-N-J-O-S-E. Follow us on um, Instagram, on Facebook. Um, I don't know what the hell's going on on Twitter, but we're still there. Um, but anyways, uh, um, who knows? Who knows why? You know, anyways. Uh, <laughs> and what's the address, the physical address? Yeah, so the address is 38 South 2nd Street. So the very first block of South 2nd Street um, here in downtown San Jose. If you, um, if you come by car, then on 3rd Street, right back there, um, there's free parking for the first 90 minutes in a city lot uh, outside. So look for the Globe parking lot. Um, and uh, actually right outside the window, um, about... Um, about 15 feet outside the window. I don't know if you can see it there. It's too, uh, um, yeah, you can kind of sort of see it. But right by that light pole, that's the that's the um, the exit from the parking garage. Ooh. So we're literally a few steps from a free parking garage from the city um, for at least the first hour and a half that you visit. So, uh, so that should take care of pretty much any sort of gallery viewing. Um, so right there on, on uh, South 3rd Street, um, and of course, uh, on Sundays, all of the street parking around here is free. Um, there's a there's a lot right across the street as well. It's not city, so it's not free ever. But uh, <laughs> but um, coming out right across the street, however, is transit. Um, so the light rail uh, stops right across the street. There's about five bus lines that I noticed, like right at the corner here, um, if you need that. So lots of access that we have. Um, so 38 South 3rd, look us up. Work San Jose. So thanks so much. San Jose. We're, we're passing by San Jose on our way up to Trinidad and be passing down. So we might just be able to step. You guys are so lucky. You got so <laughs> much going on up there. You really do. But now that I know you're going to be at San Jose, mm -hmm. I'm going to be driving through San Jose. So I might yep. just stop by. <laughs> That's pretty much the only place that work San Jose is. San Jose. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I want to give a shout out to Fred for the hat. I really like the hat. Um, and and I think that um, you know with the with the with the names of teams changing, um, I think that the Chiefs should be called the Poets. I think that would be really great. And then we'd All have right. you got, you've already got the sports hat. So thanks for that. I have to tell you, this is from uh, chapter five third uh, five ten, uh, the Department of Make Believe in downtown Oakland. And they sell these for 25 bucks and all the money goes to fund their program, teaching young people about poetry yeah. and reading. So definitely wow. chapter 510 and uh, the department of Mike believe go there and, uh, and give them some love. Thanks for that shout out. I will go and get my hat. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Fred. And my name is Robert Pesich. I'm president of Poetry Center San Jose. And tonight again, Well Read featuring Ruth Nolan and Georgiana Valois Sanchez. And uh, we will have a special guest host, Lucille Langday, introducing our guests. Uh, but first, uh, I want to do a land acknowledgement. And here it is. We acknowledge that the city of San Jose is made up of the unceded territory of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe who trace their ancestry through the local mission system. We remember and acknowledge that this land was taken through violence and dishonesty. We remember the connection the Ohlone people have to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to continue to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence now to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone peoples of the past and present. Thank you. And now some words about our support. Poetry Center San Jose, member supported organization and is funded in part by grants from Applied Materials Foundation, City of San Jose's Office of Cultural Affairs, Poets and Writers, 
Silicon Valley Community Foundation, SV Creates, in partnership with the County of Santa Clara and the California Arts Council, and also supported in part by a SV Creates National Endowment for the Arts American Rescue Plan grant. We also thank Brandenburg Family Foundation and Ann and Mark's Art Party for their generous giving. We have upcoming events that include Poetry Lounge, co-sponsored by Willow Glen Public Library, Saturday, November the 12th, 1 p.m. via Zoom, hosted by Lisa Medley. And also Third Thursdays, co-sponsored again by Willow Glen Public Library, November 17th. This is at 7 p.m., also hosted by Lisa Medley. And finally, San Jose Poetry Slam, Zoom edition. So now we've got two slams, one in person, and that is at the Tabard Theater. And this event, a slam Zoom edition, Sunday, November 27th, 6.30 p.m., hosted by Scorpion Excellent, registered through Eventbrite. And I'll provide all this information in the chat. Okay, now to introduce our guest host, for this evening, Lucille Langday, the author of seven full-length poetry collections and four poetry chapters. Her latest collection, Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place. She has also co-edited two anthologies, Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California and Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California and published two children's books and a memoir, Married at 14, A True Story. Her many honors include the Blue Light Poetry Prize, two Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Awards, the Joseph Henry Jackson Award, and 11 Pushcart Prize nominations. The founder and publisher of a small press, Scarlett Tanager Books, she received her MA in English, and MFA in creative writing at San Francisco State University, and her BA in biological sciences, MA in zoology, and PhD in science mathematics education at the University of California, Berkeley. She lives in Oakland, and more information about Lucille can be found at lucillelangday.com. Come on down as they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joining us tonight. Um, I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing Ruth Nolan and Georgiana Valois Sanchez, two of my favorite poets. Um, Ruth is going to read first. Um, I learned about uh, Ruth's poetry in 2011 when I started working on an anthology of poems about California ecosystems. And Malcolm Margolin, the founder of Heyday Books said, you have to get in touch with Ruth Nolan because you need desert poetry in this book. And so I did get in touch with Ruth and she not only submitted some wonderful uh, desert poems to the book, but she also ultimately became the co-editor of the book, Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California, which came out from my press, Scarlet Tanager Books in 2018. And I really needed Ruth's help to bring this book to fruition. I could not have done it without her. So thank you, Ruth, for that. Um, Tonight, Ruth is going to read from her new poetry collection, After the Dome Fire, from Bamboo Dart Press. Mm -hmm. And I am going to put links to information about both Fire and Rain and After the Dome Fire in the chat. So Ruth Nolan grew up in the Mojave Desert and is a professor of creative writing at College of the Desert in Palm Desert, California. A California desert literature scholar, she is the editor of No Place for a Puritan, the literature of California's deserts from Heyday Books. She's also curator of the Humanities Project on Fire on the Mojave, stories from the deserts and mountains of inland California. And this project is based in part on her own experiences as a wildlands firefighter. Imagine that, a creative 
writing professor who was once a Wildlands firefighter. Not many. So her work has appeared in many magazines and anthologies, and she developed and teaches the popular workshop, Writing Your Inner Desert, for the Desert Institute at Joshua Tree National Park. She's also the co-founder of the Creative Writing Program of the Inlandia Institute in Southern California, and she is currently the Mojave Desert Literary Laureate. So I don't think I've ever used the word desert before. And so, you know, so many times in one paragraph, she is the desert poet. And so you can see why Malcolm recommended Ruth to me. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. Um, it means so much and um, often feel really disconnected because I am here in the California desert and we don't have anywhere near as deep poetry and literary infrastructure as those of you in LA and the Bay Area have. So it's always a lot of do it yourself, but that also makes it more fun and challenging. Um, I think I started doing a lot more of this literary stuff. I was a single mom and raised my daughter. I'm teaching and working. And then my daughter grew up and got married. So I'm like, I need something to do. I'm used to having two jobs. <laughs> Sorry. So then I started throwing myself into all this, doing the Puritan book and readings and workshops. And then my daughter started having kids. And Fred, my daughter has four children now. So it's gotten really crazy. I know Fred knew me when she was just about to have the second. So um, I've gotten really busy again with that. So it's very interesting to balance it all. So uh, my new book is out from Bamboo Dark Press. It's made to look like a little record, like a single back from the old days. The guys who run this press are in Southern California in Claremont, California, near Los Angeles. And they are former punk rockers. So I think it's a very good fit. Um, so I'm gonna read a few poems from this book. I'm gonna flash over to two other books and then get back to reading my um, After the Dome Fire book. In East, um, in the East Mojave National Preserve in 2020, while the pandemic was in its, one of the worst moments, 25,000 acres of pristine Joshua Tree woodlands burned. And part of this was directly influenced by the pandemic, a lack of inmate crews and resources. So the loss is especially staggering because as someone who worked on fires out there back in the day, I kept wondering, why aren't they getting that fire out? You know, it's pretty easy to put fires out in the open desert. So it was a compounded loss. And my entire book is about fire and their impacts. Ghost Flower for Mary Beale, Desert Botanist. Shivering by day, glowing at night, blooming only in spring, this wild flower, identifiable by splotches of red bound by a white heart, attracting lovers through mimicry, not actually producing nectar. Named by a woman botanist working alone in the Mojave in the 1940s to render it bold and known. This small flower speaks with a lisp on rocky lips and forsaken cliffs flourishing where no woman should go. But there she is, forever hard to find unless you tiptoe by. And this little one is um, after Mary Austin, the great desert writer of the Mojave. Of little rain, the two-step of motherhood in a most arid place, breaking water, gushing membranes, void of life, then violent. This most evident in the odd desert when all the earth cries, its whole duty to flower, to bear fruit, to underestimate one's thirst in this land. So my next poem um, is in the Fire and Rain book and it's called Black Chinned Hummingbird, a small hummingbird of the Mojave Desert. I cut fresh sage at the mouth of Wild Rose Canyon, brought it home to dry on the old wood stove. I want to burn the damp string wrapped bundles so I can remember you, so I can forget about you. The kitchen table is full of stems and memories, things you left behind and your knife is dulled. I've been hiking old Death Valley trails alone, the hills, the dunes, the intrusive new solar farms. I had to go so far to find this year's crop of sage, drought, the sky blinded by technology stare. 
You once tried to mend the broken furniture, but wouldn't hug our daughter or braid her hair. Outside, the black-chinned hummingbird builds its tenaciously tiny nest in the blades of a palm tree, mm. weaving together dried grass and other lost things. Threads of your flannel shirt that I hate to admit I still love to wear. I wonder how long it will survive in the next hot windstorm in a season without rain. A summer full of mirrors and blades, if vultures will eat its tiny eggs, if its young will hatch strong and yearn to fly away. Thank you. I'm really involved in getting more so in um, resistance against large scale renewable energies and lithium mining. California desert is being hugely assaulted by the ravages of ongoing colonialism and extraction and it's really ugly and I, I'm living in ground zero of it here. And um, I'm working a lot with activists and um, trying to use my poetic voice to get the word out and to raise awareness and push back. And also really honored to be working with quite a few um, Native American people, members of this large desert region who are also pushing back. And I, I wanted to, I just remembered, I wanted to make a land acknowledgement <laughs> from where I'm at. I'm in um, basically the many tribes of the Cahuilla and also Chemwevi and Serrano people here in the Coachella Valley. So this poem is, um, talks about the horrible impact of one of the large solar plants that was placed on an area sacred to the Southern Paiute and in spite of comments and input pushing back against it, this all was built and they actually had displaced several thousand desert tortoises. It was a prime desert tortoise habitat and a lot of them didn't survive. And if you're driving to Las Vegas from LA, you're gonna see the towers and it's really sad and angering. Streamers shine on, shine on you crazy diamond. We thump wilderness on the desert's Eastern Ridge Joshua trees twist to the sky. Some are over 600 years old. At Ivan Paw nearby, 500 foot high solar tracking towers blind the sky, dominating valley and mountains east and west. Part of the Salt Song Trail of mm -hmm. Chemwet, Southern Paiute. Yeah. In Paiute, we thought means ancient ones, respect for age, Ivan Pa means place of white clay, relationship with source. Below, thousands of acres of mirrors reflect the sun and crush endangered California desert tortoise habitats, attracting large birds of prey, bald eagles, condors, who mistake it for water and instead burst into flames, incinerated on the spot. Orcas at Ivan Pa are mostly young, and they have a funny name for this. Streamers, they call them. Lovers and gamblers speed along Interstate 15 nearby, callously to get married or divorce, recover from their hangover, hit a jackpot on the first slot. And now for some fire poems. And um, Robert, if I'm going over my time, just let me know. The last thing I wanna be is a reading too long bummer person. Mopping up. It's the most unraveled and well-paying job I've had. Fighting flyer, fires in far-flung fiery wilderness areas in the San Bernardino Mountains, the San Gabriels, the Sierra, Gates of the Wilderness, Trinity Alps, and so many more. Most of the time, I was the only girl on the crew, as the guys called me, cutting fire line, stumbling on rocks, stucking down smoke. And after a fire had laid down on blackened meadows and burnt matchstick forests, our job was far from done. We hiked through baked potato, hot ankle deep ash to finish off dying wildfires, using our sharpened shovels to stir and sift through debris slowly, oh so meticulously, mopping up what a strange name to give this. It was nothing like being in a kitchen. We joked that incinerated animals were crispy critters, known in their former incarnations as kangaroo rat. Mojave green rattlesnakes, black-tailed jackrabbits. We struggled to keep pace in the slowed down underbelly of once so lovely if little known golden state geographies with lonely names. Rattlesnake Mountain, 
Horse Thief Spring, Last Chance Range, Grapevine Canyon, Wild Wash, Toro Peak, and so many more. And above us in the mountains, after a fire had burned through, whisper remains of trees lurked black and jagged, stripped of the dignity of their names. Jeffrey Pine, Ponderosa, Western Sequoia, Sycamore Pinion, White Fir, Incense Cedar, designated now as Widowmakers, ready to kill us with death blow limbs. And at our feet, the complete bequeathing of the latter fuels, manzanita, western juniper, coyote brush, poison oak. In spite of it all, this is what I remember most vividly from my firefighting days. The mundane, the endless mopping up, making sure the fire was put to bed, soothing feverish brows of forsaken landscapes to cool them down, tame them into some kind of domiciled complicity with the ease of a nursery rhyme. That, and I remember how often the guys on the crew kept asking me why I was out there. Why would I do that kind of work? Mm -hmm. I was a nice girl. It wasn't the place for me. Why had I left the apron strings of domesticity to flirt with fire when I should have been flirting with them instead? <laughs> Home girl. The doctor yanked her from my womb, turned her belly up to the night, the light that July night when thunderheads pillared towards the glare of full desert moon. Lightning strikes the chance of wildfire, or perhaps the oddity of flash flood, gouging out new ruts in the land, kind of like stretch marks. Because I have always inhabited deserts, I was not sure I could teach her how to swim. Now she's 11 years old, just beginning to sprout little breasts that resemble dorsal fins, this daughter who I once foolishly wished had been born a boy. And now I have three grandsons. <laughs> Each day she asked me to hook her training bra behind her back. She's a cool girl beautifying herself with beaded jewels, skimpy skirts, platform shoes, green lip gloss, borrowed from God only knows who. <laughs> I have long since forgiven her for the scar slashed across my lower gut. The stingy kisses slurped across my cheek, the way fat mouthed fish gasp for bugs hovering at the surface of the scurvy Mojave River. <laughs> and each day when she goes to school, I sneak into her bedroom, find the jars of teddy bear bottled nail polish, and with a surgeon's knife tip finesse, paint my own finger and toenails blue. <laughs> Sometimes I use red, the color of flames, instead. Love it. My poor daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much more time do I have, Robert? Maybe two more poems or uh, three poems. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the largest Joshua tree forest in the world, says oh, a sign God. in the middle of the 25,000 acre dome fire burn zone. Literally, there's a sign there. It still says, and I remember going there when this before it burned, and now I it's burned and the sign is still there. Mm. Ironically. After the before song, after this, a domed landscape of Joshua trees torn up by a firestorm unnecessarily. After this, the high ridge for agave collecting burned to a crisp. After this, it has been years since you saw a desert tortoise crawl through here. Mm -hmm. After this, the ruby-throated hummingbird is desperate for thirst. After this, a young chuckwalla doesn't back down from its fierce rock. After this, the long-haired owls claiming their only tree portending death. After this, the rattlesnake shaman circle, it's so hard to see it makes you cry. After this, the heat is killing more people this year than ever before. After this, the tender landscape, fragile and fragmented and broken light. After this, people songs, one trail leading to and from another broken start. After this, the fluid memory song in the Cottonwood Oasis where someone died. After this, the first and only evening star, remembered long before its white heart burned away. And in this little short poem, I'd like to honor the indigenous practices, um, which I'm very interested in and trying to learn more about and even participate in or to help, you know, with my general work as an educator in educating the public about wildfire and the differences between good fires and bad fires and our responsibilities and role in the fire ecologies of our state. And so this is an honor to the practices of good fire um, in many of our California tribe, 
tribal people. Good fire, I have traveled deeply into your perfect body, swallowed whole veins, carried you away in my deep pockets, ground you into dust. Never mind the strip mines, the gutted hillsides, after all else burned so recklessly and stripped away. A strange new beauty will flourish here, guided by our long practices and hands, our respect for this land. Buckwheat, manzanita, spine flower, bladder pot. Each unwatered bloom will become its own perfectly dry moon. And I just want to show you a little picture. My book has some pictures. They're all pictures I took. A friend of mine took this. But this is, I took my daughter when she was little up to an area that had burned six years earlier. And it was kind of a mix of like pinyon and pine trees and Joshua trees mm. in Southern California. And look at how those trees are still, like the limbs are still out there, but they're not gone. And that's what it looks like after Joshua trees burn. This, can, this kind of stuff can last for decades. So it looks like a graveyard and it's really haunting. And my last poem is called Teaching My Daughter to Put Out Fire. Like I said, my poor daughter. <laughs> I don't think she's seen these poems, but she'd probably be like, oh my God, stop writing about me. <laughs> it's all payback, right? Okay. It isn't your typical scenario. A young mother who worked seven years ago as a wildland firefighter, driving her Jeep in four wheel drive up three and 14 the back road to Big Bear from the desert with her daughter, five years old, to reach the rattlesnake fire burn zone. The last fire she ever fought. This is just another August day, like that one not so long ago. The mother wants to see how the mangled landscape looks today. What remains of the Joshua and Pinion trees, if anything, what birds sound filter now through barren air. What reference points to negotiate by without the Jeffrey pine or live oak, without the juniper. She worked on this fire, she watched it burn away. Huge boulder scatter revealed, ominous ghost whales rising from heavy smoke. Today, she wants to reassess, look for signs of life and regrowth. Now that so much has been taken away, this fire started with one careless toss of a cigarette. Mm -hmm. One careless finger on a trigger, a father locked away, his best friend dead. Some things have been destroyed forever. Some things have been saved. Some things new and strange are growing in this space. Will there be birds, ravens, western jay? Will there be mountain wildflowers suckling the dark and dirt? Perhaps a few deer negotiating their way across a moonscape. Still missing many of their family members on their way to a small spring, jackrabbits hopping in and out of the slowly dying and grotesquely regrowing Joshua trees. And before they reach the lonely place, they stop at an empty campground nearby so the daughter can run and play and the daughter spots it first. A wisp of smoke tickled by the light wind and rising. A careless campfire, a careless camper, their flames not put completely out. The mother reaches for her army shovel and hands her daughter a bottle of water. We have work to do. This is how you put out a fire before it has a chance to erupt. Look for the small things when you're out in about. A wisp of sultry smoke, a gleam of orange eyes, a seduction of tiny flame. This is where it starts and this is where it will stop. At least nothing more will burn here today. And um, a picture I showed you is actually taken on that day when I had that experience where we saw another fire almost starting. And um, it was really, I just remember that stirring the ashes and they'd broken a bunch of bottles in there. And I was like, I just felt really um, good that I could prevent another forest fire. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Thank if you want to know more about fires and firefighting, you can always send me an email. Um, I'm doing a lot more, and I'm going to be doing more once I retire from teaching full time. Um, public awareness, education, community forums and discussions where people can talk about preparation and knowledge. So um, it'll be the next chapter of my life after retiring from teaching full time.
Well, that was great. That was powerful yeah. and it was haunting and it yeah. really, really important work. Thank you. So our next reader is Georgiana Valois Sanchez. And as I did with Ruth, I first connected with Georgiana Valois Sanchez through my work as an anthology editor. Um, I found her work when I was editing this anthology, Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California, which I co-edited with Lakota poet, Kurt Schweigman. Um, I met Georgiana in person in 2018 when we did Red Indian Road West readings um, in Southern California at both the California Native Plant Society and Sherman Indian High School uh, in Riverside. And I was thrilled when she later got in touch with me um, and asked if I'd be interested in, in publishing her, her collection of poems. And the answer was, yes, I was interested. And I feel very fortunate to be the publisher of Georgiana's book, A Light to Do Shell Work By. And she'll be reading from this book tonight. Um, it's a beautiful and profound collection of poems in which Georgiana honors and celebrates her heritage. And I'll put a link to information about her book and Red Indian Road West in the chat. And it worked again. <laughs> um, so Georgiana Valois Sanchez is a descendant of Islander and coastal Chumash peoples from her father's lineage and Oedem and Akamel and Tohono from her mother's lineage. Uh, she is currently an enrolled member of the Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation and chair of the Chumash Women's Elders Council for the Wishtoyo Foundation. She taught many different classes for the American Indian Studies Program at California State University, Long Beach, including two classes. She designed World Genocides, an American Indian Perspective, and Conduits of California Indian Cultures, Art, Music, Dance, and Storytelling. She retired from CSULB in 2014 after 27 years. She was a board member for many years at the California Indian Storytelling Association, and she continues to be an advocate for California Indian languages and sacred sites. Her poem, I Saw My Father Today, is on display at the Embarcadero Muni Bart Station as one of 12 poems cast in bronze and placed prominently in San Francisco. Welcome, Georgiana. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor and an honor to be here with Ruth. Ruth, you had me laughing. You had me close to tears. Thank you so much for that. Um, I am see myself as a storyteller, born from a family of storytellers. And um, we were the last ever to get a television set. My father did not believe in them because the histories the stories he had to tell would just be, he knew things would change and he was so right when television would come into the home. And we were very, we were monitored. We could not just sit and watch TV. We just couldn't. And so, but I remember running home from school to watch that, uh, what's his name? He, he's lived forever. Uh, that dance studio where they're dancing around, you know? Uh, so we'd run home from school to watch that. We could watch that then we had to get ready and get started for, for dinner and uh, turn it off. But uh, I've got dad's walking stick with me. My father was born in 1897. And uh, he was, if some people, he was always grandpa, but if some people in the Chumash community forgot his name or whatever, it was always grandpa and they always remembered. And this, this walking stick, I'm trying to see, it tells a story and I'm going to start with that story. Now, I sent Joe Bruchak a bunch of poems and the three poems he chose all had old stories woven into them. And so I'm going to start with uh, about dad's dolphin walking stick. He says, 
sure you look for your spirit symbol, your totem, only it's more awaiting, watching for its coming. You listen, you listen for the way it feels deep inside. Sometimes something comes that feels almost right, the way that swordfish kept cropping up with its long nose, but no. And so you wait, knowing it is getting closer, knowing it is coming. And when that dolphin jumped out of the water, its silver blue sides all shiny and glistening with rainbows against the white cloud sky, and the ocean so big and deep, it went on forever. I knew it had come. My father rests his hand upon the dolphin's back. The dolphins gaze serene above the rainbow band wrapped around the walking stick. He leans upon his brother friend and walks across the room. As he walks, strings of seashells clack softly as when ocean waves tumble, rocks and shells and the gentle clacking song follows each wave as it pulls back into the sea. The sea. So long ago, the Channel Islands filled with too much people, like colonies of sea lions along the shore. So many people, it was time for some to make the move across the ocean to the mainland. Kakunukmawa, the sun, the great mystery, according to man's ideas, said, don't worry, I will make you a bridge. The rainbow will be your bridge. Only don't look down or you will fall. Have faith. So the chosen ones began the long walk across the rainbow. They kept their eyes straight towards where the mainland was and all around them was the ocean sparkling like a million scattered crystals. So blue green and singing, lovely and cool. Some looked down and fell into the deep to become the dolphins, they too, the people. My father turns to look at me. Someone told me that story long before I ever heard it. It's those old ones, he says, pointing up to the ceiling as if it were sky. They sent the dolphin to me. I always loved the sea. Sorry, guys. And I mean, didn't know I was going to start to cry. Miss my daddy. This beautiful man who suffered so much as a young boy, uh, he knew who he was. But we deal with things like the United States government, federal Indian identification policies, all those kinds of things that want to negate who we are as native people. And this one is for daddy. It's called Chumash man. Chumash, he says, and when he says it, I think of ancient sea lion hunts, hunts and salt spray wind swept across my face. They tell him his people are dead, terminated. It's official, US rubber stamped official. Chumash, Terminated, a people who died, they say, a case for anthropologies, anthropologists. Ah, but this old one, this old one whose face is ancient prayers come to rest. This old one knows who he is. Shumash, he says, and somewhere sea lions still gather along the California coast and salt spray rises, rainbow mist above the constant breaking of the waves. I was 12 years old, going on 13, when the Chumash people were terminated. And uh, years later, I went on a pilgrimage to all of the missions in honor of the ancestors, thousands of them buried at each mission. And um, I remember mama saying, daddy, go, go and, and get the proof to show that, so you could get some money because 
we knew that uh, Anthony Morales and them, because they married into our family, they're Tongva, Gabrielino, want to acknowledge that that's why I'm living now in their land, that the Tongva like Gabrielino got some money. And, there, and maybe we could get some money because, it, of course, our homeland was taken away since the Spaniards came and, the, uh, and we were part of their colony. And then we became part of the Mexican Republic. And then, like my grandfather used to say, uh, my dad's dad. Uh, and then the Yankees came. So that's what things got pretty bad, especially during um, uh, the, the, gold, the gold rush horrible things that I won't, I won't go into now, maybe in some other poem, some other, some other time. But, uh, but they were terminated because all of their homeland, coastal land, the islands off the coast of Southern California, Malibu, think Santa Barbara, think all of those are now some of the most expensive real estate in Southern California. So I cannot write poems like this and tell stories like this without getting out there with my community and with our neighboring community like the Tongva, the Gabrielino, fight for Povugna, fight for the sacred sites. I'm so grateful for Ruth Nolan because she has this affinity, this love, this understanding of the land of the desert. I'm gonna read about the desert because mother was from the desert. And I thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Um, so that those were hard, but you know, my dad would I know what my land is. I would take him up to the Chumash meetings and he would say, he'd look at all these buildings, he'd say, he'd laugh and he'd say, oh, they think they own this land, he'd say. And he'd sort of chuckle like the jokes on them, like they think they own the land. Um, let me see. Gosh, there's so many and we don't have the time. Uh, Dad loved the ocean. We were born close to the ocean. My brother was in the army and he was stationed at Fort Huachuca, which is in the middle of the desert. And he had claustrophobia because he was so far from the ocean. And this is called the universe we are. There was a pull to the sea beyond its moon tides and cool blue water, more because the mind cannot fathom its vast depth and span, a world so subject to fences and small definitive places, and so much water reaching so far and so far down quickens the spirit to sense of mysteries deep and far reaching. Along the shore, the thunder and hush of each crashing wave echoes my own blood pulse as it ebbs and flows through my veins. I breathe the salt air and each cell of my body rocks in the sea of its own primordial past. I walk bare feet tingling at the water's edge and seabirds dart and rise, wheeling on white wings against the wide blue sky. And just beyond the bend of sea cliffs, rising from a sheltered cove, seashells tumble from the waves into my waiting hands, the tracings on the seashells telling stories as I turn them in the sun, reminding me of the universe we are. The Inland Sea is really about, um, I focus on my mother. She was an amazing, I don't know, wondrous. She found wonder in everything. And she could make the most difficult people love her. She was just amazing. I hope I don't cry, guys. I mean, I've been missing them so much lately, especially when I was in the hospital and sick. I miss them so much. And this one is called The Inland Sea. I separate the book into three prose poem pieces, and then I enter, go into another thing. So the, here for Ruth, this is for Ruth. The desert was in bloom. 
blue verbenas and white desert primrose spread out across the sand dunes that followed the windy highway north of Indio, California. Red flowers as small as the tip of a newborn's finger bloomed next to seashells in wind-cleared patches of speckled earth. My mother and I were kneeling, marveling at the flowers and seashells, while my father stood speaking into the wind about the markings on the distant blue mountains that traced the ancient, ancient sea and how fish fossils had been found embedded in rock. Wind whistled through the flowers and sand swirled and rose like sea mist. My father knelt beside us, cradling the seashells and flowers and the song of wind on water blew across the desert like a prayer. I have to read these two. I read it at the last reading uh, with Lucy, but I have to read it because it so captures mom, these, these next two poems. Very simple, like mama, but profoundly wise and funny, just funny, loved everybody, loved everything. Mama's water story. My papa go pee my mama is round and brown like a clay water oya nourishing, giving us life. Mama would tell us about the clay water oya, how it would sit beneath the shade of the ramada, about the hot desert sun and how she would dip the cord into the cool water to drink. Imagine, she would say, as we gathered around her long ago in our poor city kitchen. She would fill a large pan with tap water and we would dip our bowls as gourds into the water to drink. And as we savored the water, she hinted at the taste of wet clay and told us of the water soaked edges of the gourd dipper and how she loved to bite into the gourd despite grandma's scolding. We drank deeply, tasting the gourd and wet clay feeling the distant ancient land beneath our bare feet, feeling the hot sun and relentless desert beyond the shade of the Ramada, knowing that water was life. In those growing up years of strawberry Kool-Aid and ice cold Coca-Cola, we learned to love the taste of water. And this one is so mama. It's called Almond Trees. And apparently, uh, the, Pat Merklin from uh, Dorothy Ramon, she's so knowledgeable about so much. She said that stone um, uh, nuts and fruit, like peaches and almonds, used to grow very well around Banning, Cabazon, Beaumont, places like that. So this is called Almond Trees, because mother worked in an almond tree field. Driving down Freeway 60 with Mama toward the Indian Health Clinic on the Morongo Reservation in Banning, California, Mama leans forward in her seat and asks, are we there yet? Have we come to the place where the almond trees aren't there anymore? So many almond trees, they covered that whole place all the way to the foothills. In the springtime, the white blossoms were like snow on the mountains at sunset. So many almond trees. There it is, there it is, she says, pointing to a 30 acre star of bare earth, seeing so many almond trees that aren't there anymore. And that was mama. She saw wonder in, in us kids, even when we were like, God only knows what we were into, but you know. Um, I think I've got, room for three more yeah it's robert left yeah Lucy, you think three more i think yeah three more would certainly be fine okay uh starry yeah. night because a lot of them weren't that long okay starry night we are the stars which sing we sing with our light we are the birds of fire we fly over the sky 
Our light is our voice. We make a road for the spirit to pass over from the Algonquian Song of the Stars. It is a profound Picacho night. The red earth hills are black against the star-filled sky. There is no moon. We walk as shadows through the family camp, flashlights in hand. Summer on the central fire speak in hushed tones, laughter punctuating the darkness. Most are silent, looking up in awe at billions of stars, alive and pulsating in the dark night. Half remembered star stories emerge. Seven sisters changed to doves, escaping Orion, who always pursues, and then again, they may be the Blackfoot ones who fled their poverty to become stars, or a great bear tracking across the endless sky. The Milky Way white papago beans, a scattered trail left by a boy to tell the autumn of his new life. The white beet bean trail reminding the, the dark night that everything would be all right. I lie outside the tent, warm in my sleeping bag, cool breeze across my face, looking into the night sky, taking in the immensity of it all, a billion stars pulsating in my veins, my blood, the mystery, the universe, still point and flowing. The Big Dipper has moved, slides down the sky toward where the Colorado River flows alongside the sleeping camp. Ghosts walk among us, great grandpa long dead, the old Picacho town site transparent in starlight. Grandma, daddy, mama, breathing in our midst, the light of stars long dead, alive and shining this dark night. Coyote cubs yip beyond the dark hills. I want to sleep with my eyes wide open, taking in the sweep of night, billions of stars. I cannot lose this, but I sleep. Dreaming, I live a bird of fire, singing my light in a universe of endless stars. The note that I have down here is to explain to you. Oh, Fred would read a poem, all right. <laughs> no, the, the town of Picacho, California was founded by my great grandfather, Jose Maria Mendeville. He was Akimil Otam, Pima, and Basque. When he was about eight years old, he became a captive of an Apache raiding party. He was adopted by one of the leaders and raised in an Apache until he was about 18 years old. He knew Cochise. Cochise was a close friend of their war chief of the band that he was with, who were the White Mountain Apache. He was later captured by the United States Army and became a translator. After my great grandfather married a Tohono O'odham Papago woman, Jesusa, and had a family, he founded Picacho. He married this, they named the streets after his daughters, Pilar, Ramona, and Lolita. My maternal grandmother was Pilar. Today, Picacho is often referred to as a ghost town. This poem is for my beloved grandmother, Pilar, my mother, Rosita, and my mendable relatives. I, I kind of had to, there's such a backstory to that, that all of us camping. They let us go free. They give us rides on the thing because we were all mendable relatives. They've got a big plaque there by an old gold mine talking about him. And uh, so, and uh, we have so many family stories about this amazing man. And he died alone in a poor little kitchen style hut where my grandmother was living with the Ramada outside. They mostly lived outside. They didn't live inside the, inside the house. Uh, and he died there with her. Uh, he wanted, uh, he wanted, uh, they were allotted land at the Colorado River Reservation. So dad always used to say, she's the real Indian, you know, because they had already terminated his people. He knew who he was, but he'd always say, she's the real Indian. Okay, um, this one I, I love a lot because it's about mama and daddy. And it's also about us. 
This one and then one more. This is not too long. It's called Stardust. 5 a.m., the reservation still, the battles of the night before, the hidden hurts that rise in dreams, drifting to some lost and fading place. My mother and father sleep silhouetted in moonlight. I pause beside their bedroom door, blessed by their breathing, before stepping outside into the dark, cool, quiet. The old dog comes from under the house and stands beside me. A silver wash of sky begins low beyond the foothills. It is an ancient glow, I know again. Holy, the silence, the still point between night and dawn, when moon and stars still cast soft light upon the hillside and rocks and stones shine, become stars wedded to earth in some grand cosmic time. I stand beside the dog, our blood and bones, a spectral band of stellar matter held in the center of the turning earth. Stardust standing amidst a field of stones, of stars, our eyes turned toward this rising sun and the new day. And like I told Deborah Miranda at our last reading, I, one dog seemed to fit in the poem, but there were probably four dogs that were all jostling, trying to be stand by me. I don't know, maybe they were hungry or something, because people would just leave their dogs there and dad would bring them home. And he'd name them things like King and Bingo. And, you know, he always had a bunch of dogs around him. Pitiwa, Pitiwa was, they, somebody shot her at night, Pitiwa on the wrist. It's like, oh my God. Okay. Last one, last one, last one, last one. The last one is about when my father died. It's the last words that he said. He was one of the most intelligent, profound thinkers I have ever known in my life. And that means a whole bunch of professors that I seem to know, uh, you know, that I knew over the years, 27 years of teaching at the university. My father was an amazing man. And so this is about the last day of his life. And so it's for my dad, Joseph John Moreno, who was born June 5th, 1897, and he died on August 15th, 1991. He lived to be 94. One day, all of life catapulted into one day, one moment of sunlight, filtering through the high bedroom window framed by blue curtains, filtering through the waiting of the grown-ups, sunlight and the laughter of children outside, warming my father's dying. My father turns his head to acknowledge the sun. The light, the light, he says, and the light within. It's a good light to do shell work by. The ocean sang in my father's hands. Abalone pendants shimmered rainbows from the ears of pretty girls and shell were dotted driftwood carvings, cowrie shells, cone shells, volute shells, red, black, white, blue, brown, green shells, the life they once held sacred, old stories etched on the lifeline of my father's palm. I hold my father's hand, my own shell work words, my poet's eye noting the light, how through the bedroom door, the ears of fresh white corn piled on the kitchen table harvest the afternoon sun. Touches how the light shines through a glass of water. Touches my mother's white hair as she leans to embrace my father. The hush of twilight and how the sunset, like a trail of wild lupins, or the tracings on seashells tell stories of our origin as it lights up the sky with fire. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Lucy. Oh boy, I saw Fred's gonna read, yes. Oh, thank you Thank you, so you Fred, much. thank you for all you did to on the book, thank you. And thank you, Georgiana. That was just a, a beautiful reading. I just I love the way 
your poems bring those stories to life and um and I you know I can I can see your parents I can see the desert I can see the sea and Ruth your your reading was marvelous too and it's okay. interesting how um your poets can your poems converge in the yeah. desert <laughs> yes. yeah I think I know that place Georgiana I'm pretty I go off into the where the ancient Lake Kauia came up I was just down there um a few days ago to an area where there's you can actually find abalone shell. They're very, very right. Cool. Isn't that amazing? Oh my God. They're Isn't very that amazing? And potsherds. I found potsherds. Yeah. And um, there's an area with petroglyphs in the rock coral that's been formed. Um, yeah, it's incredible. And just to hear you reading that and talking about your father going there and praying, you know, and honoring it really means a lot to me because I, I can just feel myself there. Yeah. It's a very beautiful place. Me too. It's like, I struggle sometimes not to cry because I'm there again. Yeah. And I miss those times. But I'm taking my grandson out by where you live because we're going to go look for the desert tea. They call it Mormon tea. Yeah. We call it stick tea so, so that he can know. And also, too, I'm going to call you because I need to know about creosote mm -hmm. bush. Daddy said that yeah. was a cure-all. Yeah. Creosote bush was a cure-all. Mm -hmm. He would actually drink it. Yeah, yes. I mean, he he was drinking it, and Sue went. My sister, she goes, "Why are you drinking, Daddy?" Goes, "You want to try some?" And he had like this little thing in his eye, twinkling yeah. in his eye. He passed the cup over to her. She drank it. She said she, she didn't know. She almost choked yeah. on it. It was just really strange and strong. She had never drank it. There's an area about an hour from where I live in the Mojave Desert. Um, it's called King Clone, but it's because the creosote bushes, they clone themselves. It's kind of the same plant growing over and over and they grow in these big circles. And there's an area and they've dated one of the rings to be over 14,000 years old. Whoa. And um, I've actually been to it and um, there's a lot of rings in that one area. We have to be careful are, where, where we gather. They might not yeah. let us. We wouldn't want to do it there, but um, it's an ecological preserve. But um, yeah, we shouldn't. I mean, because they're out. It's out there in the desert. It is. Just oh, it's everywhere. There. It's the main. It's everywhere. Plant. Yeah, it's the, the number one plant. So yeah. anyway. Anyway, Sorry, thank you. Easy. Oh. Thank Sorry, you. Easy. <laughs> and now we're gonna have we're going to have an open mic that um Rob is going to host. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lucille. And again, thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Georgiana. Another round of applause for them. Yes, that's so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have an open mic. And uh, the open mic will start with Fred Dodsworth. And um, then uh, up after Fred will be. Mary Marsha Casoli. Fred, come on down. Hi, I have to say, uh, I spent a lot of time with Georgiana's work and hearing you read Georgiana was wonderful. And your tears were not unexpected or unloved. They were, they were appropriate and right on. And I had mine right there with me. It's a, <laughs> a beautiful, beautiful stories you tell in your poems. And that made me want to read this piece. I do want to read oh, two good. short poems. I tend to read write really long, but these are pretty short. And both of these are very fresh uh, uh, last Friday and uh, unedited. So there it is. Oh, great. Isn't every poem a silly love song full of pain and tears for years? As I try to write all of the world's wrongs. Aren't I just writing of love gone awry? The painful broken heart of empathy, the ability to see all other lives in me, the need to share and care and feed those who have less than is seemly. When I look out at a beautiful vista or the detritus of our wait wasteful world, shouldn't I be looking inside instead to recognize all we think we see is seen in contrast mm -hmm to what should be. The love of lost beauty is still a celebration. The potential of what was and might still be silly me, thinking all this ruin was a waste. For from such debris and decay comes a new something unexpected, something shiny and new, a sublime thing, but only if you're willing to look deeply. 
-hmm. if you're willing to see the beauty in all the parts before assembly, the way it fits back together again, just without you, without me, how it is and how it should be. Whoa, whoa, love that, love that, thank you. Whoa. Then the other one is, a. Uh, I used to be a reporter and so I wrote a news story um, and this is, uh, you'll recognize it. It's called About That Night. And I wrote this last Friday. The news this morning, a horror story fit for Halloween. A local man, 42 years old, an angry white man filled with lies who lived a life of privilege, stormed a home after midnight where he found a man alone where he hoped to find the wife. Where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? The madman raged, his mind set on assassination. As he hammer bludgeoned the man alone, the 82-year-old husband of a woman who spent her life trying to better ours, a madman driven insane and homicidal by lies he heard on the same airwaves where symphonies are offered, where children's stories are told where sadly some make millions fanning the flames of hatred. Mm. 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 Whoa, yeah. And I'm so glad I'm with you. I did not want, I did not want the TV on today. I'm so afraid. I'm just afraid. And I, it's so good to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Your beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so much. Now, Please welcome Mary Marsha Casoli. Yay. Yay. Hey. Okay. I want to say it was so beautiful. I just love the hummingbird, the feeling of being in the desert, and the feeling of your family. Um, so th there were so many beautiful aspects of the poem tonight. So I feel rather. Um, I'm just offering, I'm going to offer this poem because yes. I can't. <clears throat> autumn, in the, is, <clears throat> autumn is in the air. Autumn, the poet of the impaired, doesn't wail life's irksome, never wails lonesome, unless scoffs and dares examination, scoffs wearing an iron staircase buffeting orange magenta with care, because warmth can't be imitated merely or meekly. Rolls are uncovered in uncommon places. Manholes are covered by common flares. Autumn, the poet of the impaired heart, tells of narrows, smells arrowroot and sorrows. Wish responds, a single glove is absurd, unshared. Autumn, the poet of the impaired, labors by kindle, labors by knife. Cold everywhere, therefore buffets need bassoons. Political baboons best be held back by the rough of their hair. That's why Autumn, the poet of the impaired song, loves strawberry guava. Autumn is in the air, loves you, and drops your supposed disabilities. But truly, you need never be squared or spared. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Marsha. Yes. Well, uh, is anyone else uh, interested to share for the open mic? And I want to share how much I loved Ruth's poetry. I uh, have rarely gotten a chance to hear it. It really was beautiful to hear your stuff. And I look forward to buying your new book. Thanks, Fred. Me too. Me too. Okay, Brandon. <laughs> So yeah, if there's no one else who wants to read at the open mic, I wanted, I'd like to read two poems. We'll have uh, Brandon up and, oh. and I think Pushpa McFarlane, yes? 
Yes, I'll try that. <laughs> okay, so Brandon is up and following Brandon will be Pushpa and to conclude will be Lucille. Go ahead, Brandon. Do please excuse me. I am a bit ill, but I'll try my best. I finally found that old road I'd been looking for, the one I'd nearly forgotten about, where I had run the length of the hill sideways, long above the angle of the setting sun that hangs above the city below, where you could swear it was a monkey howling and not a rooster, a flock of roosters howling in the late afternoon, in this thinning farmland, not forest, forest, not jungle, where there are no landmines, and the heartbeat catching in your throat is not from fear of a bullet in the thicket, but a mountain lion's footsteps gnawing at your mind before the sudden sound of a small dog barking behind you from a gated fence throws you three feet in the air that might as well have been 30 meters off the side of a cliff into dark waters, into rising tide, into the unknown washing above your head Monsoon season again. It is not dry salt against your brow, only sweat high on your back. The ocean is far away from you now. It is time to go home again. And the road can only be a memory, cresting like the waves. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. And uh, now we will uh, go to Pushpa McFarlane. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I thought I, I wouldn't read earlier because I was feeling very tired and sleepy, but I thought maybe I will go ahead and read one poem. <clears throat> this is about my father, a father's funeral, waiting for the taste of ashes. As children, we all knew our father would always be there for us, that we would live happily ever after, that we all would be together just as we believed, happily together till kingdom come. But it's never that simple. We do what should be done, getting a priest, repeating the chants, people gathering to say they're sorry, paying the priests for their services, overseeing every little details, everything set in motion as tears linger in the eyes, words unable to express the separation, dust to dust, how quickly the fire envelops the body, no longer in pain, no longer to hold your father, but smell the heat watch the ashes lift up in fragments and into the air as it swirls up gray bits of flakes rising up mm. you're crying a river when it's time to leave thank you mm. thank you thank you pushpa thank you for sharing and now we go to Lucille, who will close out the open mic and uh, who will send us home with uh, a couple poems. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to do was read a poem from each of the anthologies that brought Ruth and Georgiana into my life. So I'll start with a poem from Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California. Um, and this poem uh, is called Cracking and it takes place at Point Reyes National Seashore. A gray fox leaves its mark, twisted droppings on the trail. No silvery back or rusty flank splash in lupin and coyote brush by the path and no short barking yips ride ocean wind. In daylight, the gray fox hides in its den somewhere on the rocky declivity, but each four-toed imprint capped with claws like candle wicks says the gray fox walked here where irises and ice plant give way to dune grass holding sand in place. 
Far out on mud flats, another sign. Deep five-toed tracks in pairs, right rear foot, plantigrade by left front, means none other than raccoon out in the dark at low tide for the day's first shellfish and insect pickings. Triangular marks crossing raccoon tracks say black-tailed jackrabbit after succulent grass on the island on the flats where I stop to eat to eat and make plaster casts. Tennis shoe prints leading back to the dunes will be erased at high tide and I'll take my trash back to civilization, leaving only these words to trace the fact that I walked here, I ate, I sang. And um, I'll conclude with a poem, one of my poems from Red Indian Road West. And this is called At Lake Tahoe. Granite mountains dense with white firs, lodgepole pines and ponderosas rise abruptly from the lake's blue bowl so deep its waters could cover all of California and Nevada. The Washoes who lived here 10,000 summers named it lake in the sky because it reflected clouds, sunset and stars. They caught Lahant and trout in the lake, mountain whitefish in icy streams. On the other side of the continent, my Wampanoag ancestors were gathering cranberries, covering their summer homes with cattail mats, baking clams, drying corn, and fishing for salmon off Cape Cod. The Washoes used only fallen trees for homes they would dismantle before leaving Lake in the Sky each winter. In fall, they gathered pinion pine nuts to eat until spring. This was before white people came and cut down the pinion pines to build their houses, dynamited the mountains in search of silver and gold and claimed the fish. Now, a paddle boat with three decks takes tourists on cruises of Lake Tahoe. Yet in summer, Washoes still do the pine nut dance and Wampanoags do the grass dance to keep the world in balance and remind us that the earth is living. Every rock is sacred and every tree and salmon has a soul. Thank you. Mm. So this is, has been wonderful. I just, I, I really yeah. love being the guest host. So thank you so much, Rob. Um, and sure. thank you um, to Georgiana and Ruth for your beautiful poems. And as we would say in the Wampanoag language, katapatanamu, uh, that's thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you, Lucille. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Georgiana. And thank you all for participating in the open mic. And yes, I want to thank you, everyone, in the open thank mic, too. You were all great. It was an honor. I just one last question for Ruth. Ruth, could you please bring me a copy of your book? I'd like to get it from you. I will do from you. Yeah. Yes. When I, I see you there, please. Absolutely. Yes. And I'll be in touch with you soon to do your interview. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a call. <clears throat> and we'll have information, folks, uh, uh, how to get your copy of the books um, uh, in the uh, description in the YouTube channel. And thanks, Fred, for all your work on the uh, book. Uh, light to do shell work by and um, it was the, really all Lucy <laughs> <laughs> no he he is the he is the one who did the design oh you know but they kept me in everything they kept me in the loop what do you think about this what do you think about that they were wonderful they were just included me I'm just thank you so much for that Lucy's very good about taking care of her authors <laughs> <laughs> Uh, love to all of you. Uh, Thank you. And a go in good health uh, into the new year and uh, also for your families as well and uh, young and old. Okay. 
And uh, we look forward to seeing you again here in San Jose. Uh, stop on by <laughs> if you're in town. <laughs>